What's up, everybody? I'm John Middlecoff. You know what I need you to do? Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We got content for days reacting to every NFL game all the time, every single day. Subscribe, like the videos. Let's go. What is going on? We had ourselves a little overtime battle between the fighting Baker Mayfields and the mid-90s Bulls, a.k.a. the Chiefs, who just never lose. Even when things get weird, even when you go, oh, maybe it's not going to be their night, torrential drown pour, thought Bulls might go for two, ended up not, overtime, drive right down the field, game over. The Chiefs don't lose. They are now 8-0, um, poised to get the number one seed. It just, it really is just never ending. It, it's it's crazy. It's crazy to watch because you just think like, no, no, oh yeah, oh, yeah it's the Chiefs. Uh, but very, very valiant effort from Baker. Uh, I do want to touch on that after we talk about the Chiefs and his offensive coordinator. I mean, those two guys had a fantastic night, and honestly, they're having an incredible season. So uh, props to the Bucs. What makes Monday Night Football so fun is that you, you might have lost three or four games. You might be out your some of your best players, but it's national television. These players take it seriously, and, and you get team's best effort. That, that was... That second half was pretty good. First half was a little eh. Second half and the, the fourth quarter and overtime were really intense. And then we got to do a little penthouse and outhouse. We we had a uh, we have a new addition with the porta potty Panthers because if you're going to make fun of the Panthers, you got to make fun of the team that they just beat and that team fired their coach this morning. So uh, clearly the Chiefs are are hanging with the penthouse with a couple other AFC teams, but uh, and the Lions, you know, they, they threw their hat in the ring. Also want to discuss Philly. You know, Dallas Dak is injured now, which not ideal. I mean, the Cowboys, the, the Cowboys got major problems in Harbaugh, just doing Harbaugh things. What an incredible season, again, for a guy that you hire him, your team just wins. But before we dive into a little football, can I tell you about how you can go to a football game? That Chiefs game, just what what a great home crowd. Rain, wind, doesn't matter. Places packed, going nuts. Don't blame them. I mean, they're watching greatness. Uh, if you want to go to a game, college, pro, if you want to go to a football game, I got you covered. Because the official ticketing app of this podcast, Game Time, they have, they're, one, they're the best ticketing app in the business, bar none, not even close. You can go to any sporting event, any concert, any comedy show, any event, you search by venue, you search by team, you search by artist, you can pick price points. They got great flash deals. I cannot recommend them enough. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code JOHN for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code JOHN for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Lowest prices, lowest tickets. Let me rephrase that. Last minute tickets, lowest price is guaranteed. I can't even imagine being a Chiefs fan. It doesn't get any better than this. This is the pinnacle, the peak of being a sports fan. This is what it had to feel like living in Chicago in the early and late 90s, watching Jordan. If you lived in New York in the late 90s, early 2000s with the Yankees, I saw it when I lived in the Bay Area when Kevin Durant showed up. And even a couple of years before, you just never thought the Warriors were going to lose, ever. And that's what it feels like watching the Chiefs. You're like, yeah, their offense just isn't that good. They're relying on Kareem Hunt, who they had to sign off the street because their starting running back broke his leg. You're like, God, he doesn't look that good. And but as the game starts going, you're like, God, he actually kind of looks good. You're like, ah, oh, Travis Kelsey's kind of old. Doesn't quite move the same. Only runs these five and six yard routes. And then as the game goes on, he just consistently catches those routes. DeAndre Hopkins, what a classic. That drive, honestly, I thought the game was over with, you know, about a little under 13 minutes. The Chiefs get the ball. It is 17 to 17. They have a 15 play, eight and a half minute drive that went 75 plus to score the touchdown. When, you know, Mahomes uh, lobs it to Pirine, and I guess that was earlier in the game. That's when he hit Hopkins, and he had already gotten hurt, but then he was fine and came back. A little scare, but obviously everything was all right. He played the rest of the game. 
but he hits Hopkins for a second touchdown of the game. And you're like, what an incredible championship drive. Like they got it all, even though they don't because their stud running back has a broken leg and is out still another month. Their best wide receiver is on injured reserve. And they're relying on, as you saw earlier in the game, Worthy, who is a very talented player. A little raw. I mean, Mahomes hit him down the sideline, couldn't get both feet in bounds. A little embarrassing. Kelsey, I I think it is fair to say, I I do think he will show up for the playoffs. He's not what he once was. And then Hopkins, who probably runs a 5-0-40, was fantastic tonight. I mean, that trade tonight was like an organizational move. It's like, yeah, we made this move early for a reason. This guy's going to help us out. And obviously, they don't win the game without him. And Mahomes, Kareem Hunt, DeAndre Hopkins, Kelsey, they drive him right down the field and score a touchdown. I thought the game was over. And then the Bucs get the ball back. They go three and out. Then the Chiefs get the ball back. They go three and out. You're like, this is nuts. Then the Bucs get the ball back again with a little bit under two minutes and 20 seconds. You're like, there's no way. And then Baker Mayfield, who, listen, there are not, I don't know, Is he's a top 10 quarterback. Like, I obviously, he I wouldn't say he's a top five guy with Lamar, Allen, Stafford, Mahomes, uh, Herbert. Like, those guys would all get drafted before he did. But I think when you start talking, obviously, Jared Goff this season, like, there aren't many quarterbacks playing as well as this guy. And tonight, a lot like Mahomes, he ain't really playing with a full deck. His best receiver has messed up hamstring. His second best wide receiver, who was having an elite contract year, shattered his ankle, and he's thrown to Sterling Shepard and Kate Otten, who is a good player, and his running backs. At one point in time, when the Bucs took the lead in this game, 14-10, to 10, they showed a graphic. His wide receivers had two catches. His running backs had four, and his tight ends, all being Otten, had five. So, like, what a night from Baker Mayfield and his offensive coordinator. Because they had no business, given their injuries, you know, on paper, competing in this game. But this is what makes Monday Night Football so fun, is that you get these fun games. Because regardless what your record is, and now the Bucs have lost four out of five games, this is a kitchen sink game for them. They know you're playing on primetime, you're playing on national television against the two-time defending champs, Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes, and you give it all you got. And their quarterback, I thought for the most part, was flawless. And Mahomes was excellent too. Both those guys, like what a high-level quarterback game in a driving rainstorm when clearly it was very difficult to keep your feet. Obviously, that's why Mahomes is an all-time great and why Baker Mayfield has reestablished himself or just established himself, because you would say he never really was, as a top-10 quarterback in the NFL. And honestly, this year he's closer to five than he is 10. He he has been fantastic, but I I think if you wanted to nitpick the Bucs, they drive that. Liam Cohen's play calling tonight, because his wide receivers are so limited, getting rid of the ball fast, running a bunch of quick outs, getting the ball to the running backs in the flat, hoping they can make plays, and they did pretty consistently, even if it's just gaining five or six yards, not having Baker hold it too long, especially in a rainstorm, and they they drive that. The play call to get the game-tying touchdown was just fantastic. Aikman crushing Todd Bowles for calling the timeout. You know, heat of the moment. If you don't have another play call, you're coming a long way. I, I think it's easy to be sitting there and saying it. I, I, I do think kind of a tough spot. Uh, but regardless, it worked out fine. I, I think if you do want to nitpick him, it's like, listen, you're, you've already lost to Tampa or excuse me, Atlanta twice. It is going to be, you, you're playing the chiefs now and you got the 49ers in six days. You probably just want to put all your cards in the middle of the table. You, you just ran two plays that could have scored. I mean, if Otten holds on to the ball, that's a touchdown. The very next play, easy touchdown. Clearly your two point plays and essentially what you're running are pretty good. Like Liam Cohen, think about all the negativity. Let's just use a guy, Shane Waldron. Everyone thinks he's the village idiot, rightfully so. The Raiders couldn't get rid of their offensive coordinator, who ironically had come from Chicago, Luke Getze, fast enough. They fired him, the quarterback coach, the offensive line coach. It's clear you watch some offensive coordinators, regardless of quarterback, you're like, they have no feel for play calling. Like, regardless of how talented the guys you have running your offense, 
you can feel if they have like a, just an innate ability and a, a rhythm to their play calling. And if you've watched Liam Cohen all season long, he has been awesome. And if you wanted to argue it's one thing to do with Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, like, okay, he's got a full deck. How about you take those two guys away and you go to toe-to-toe with a big-time defense, a championship defense, on the road in a rainstorm? And him and Baker answered the bell. So I, I think, like, what do you got to lose? Why not just go for it there? Because basically when you kick the field goal, which let's face it now with the uh, – how the extra point, whatever, 35 plus yards, it's not a gimme in the rain. And even Aikman, as he said, I would have gone for two. You start thinking like, is he going to slip and miss this? And then you give them a chance. They had 27 seconds. Now, ultimately, they ended up punting. But you're basically just taking a 50-50 coin flip, right? And I'm against always going for two, as some of these teams do. Like, I'm cool with kicking field goals and just throwing up one point when we score touchdowns. I think that's a spot that you got to go for, especially with how well your quarterback's playing. Go for the jugular right there. And he didn't, and ultimately it cost him because you give the ball back to, you know, the mid-90s Bulls or the late-90s Yankees, like they're going to win because they always win. I was just looking at the, uh, you know, the conference standings, and it's like you watch the Bills, you're like, God, this offense is awesome. How good is Josh playing? You watch the Ravens when they're on, they're just scoring 40 with ease. And then you watch the Chiefs. <laughs> it's like, you know, halfway through the fourth quarter, like, are they going to be able to punch this in to get over, uh, you know, to get from 17 to 24? Like, it is a difficult proposition for them to move the ball. They are not an explosive offense. And yet they're undefeated. And they have a clear cushion over teams like the Ravens and the Bills, who are clearly Super Bowl contenders. And the Chiefs are just chugging along. So, uh, very entertaining game. Uh, it's just, you just can't beat this team. I mean, you you really can't. They just find a way. Obviously, the big scare when Mahomes fell a little funny on his ankle or hip pointer or something going on, had to be carried for like half the way, and then he started walking. Obviously, you know, Carson Wentz starts warming up. Your kind of heart drops. You're like, no, please be okay. And obviously, he shook it off, and, and everything was all right, but... I thought both those two quarterbacks, just gutty performances, that that is not easy. I mean, that was a Chiefs defense that a couple weeks ago made Kyle Shanahan and Brock Purdy look like scrubs. Thoroughly embarrassed them. And for Liam Cohen, you know, we talk a lot about people interviewing and people love throwing around names. And obviously, that you know, after two weeks, it was, it was Kubiak's kid in New Orleans. Well, that train fell off the tracks. Slowick's offense has been having a lot of issues. I don't care what their record ends up being. If you just watch the Bucs play offense, like if you watch the Chiefs play offense and the Bucs play offense, like those are just two well-run operations given what they have. Like I defend the Chiefs. I'm like, why is their offense not more explosive? I don't know. They have a 36-year-old jet setter at tight end. They have a young kid worthy who clearly swim in a little bit. They have Kareem Hunt who was on the street. I mean, what what do you expect? The 99 Rams, like that, that's not going to happen here. So it's same thing with the Bucs. So for both those two teams in a rainstorm, how many offensive coordinators in the league, given the personnel of those two teams, would have been able to get around 24, 25 points at the end of regulation in that environment? I, I don't know if many could. So very, very impressive night from a coaching standpoint. It's funny, you watch, there are so many shitty teams in the league right now. And you watch so many poorly coached operations. And then you like, if I'm a Bucks fan, I'm holding my head high. Like this, this team this year, if it wasn't for some injuries, uh, we we are right there. We are a playoff team. I feel pretty confident about that. Obviously not now. They're going to probably end up being seven or eight wins. And God, given their injuries and how many guys have missed games who are missing them now and missed games earlier, it's, it's coaching. Now, if you want to, like, Todd, you got to be a little more aggressive. And I, I think there's a balance of, like, Sirianni's reckless nature and just, like, now's the time. Like, now's the time to pounce. <laughs> now's the time to put your chips in the middle of the table. Now's the time to take a big swing. And it's just clearly not really in his nature. And ultimately, I, I think it's a big reason that they didn't win. And now they've got the 49ers 
in six days who are going to bring in Christian McCaffrey and you're really leaking oil and it, it kind of could fall apart here. But I, I, I was really impressed with just the Bucks effort and moxie and just no quit because I, I think some teams might've folded uh, especially after Mahomes drove them because Andy and Mahomes and that defense who actually, you know, gave it up at the end. They, they just, they're tough, man. You, you, you can't, it's 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 really pretty crazy. I mean, I, I can't imagine being a Chiefs fan like my age. Most of your life, even the good teams, never did shit in the playoffs. And then you guys just had some horrendous teams. And now for basically the last five or six years, it feels like you're unbeatable. Obviously, you haven't won it every year. You've lost in the Super Bowl. You've lost an AFC Championship game. But like the Patriots for 20 years, it honestly feels like you guys never lose. And this feeling, it doesn't get any better as a sports fan. It doesn't get any more enjoyable. You have, over the course of the last six years, won in every conceivable way. Tight games, blowouts, come from behinds, guys injured, coming back from injury in a game. Uh, It's just, it's been remarkable to watch. There are so many parallels with those kind of Patriot dynasty uh, and just the mental toughness finding ways to win in games where you just don't have it. Uh, guys get injured, and next guy comes up. You're like, who are you playing with? And the Hopkins trade, I mean, that's – you talk about speaking about being aggressive. Todd Bowles not aggressive. Well, the Chiefs were aggressive a couple years uh, weeks ago and traded for this guy. And a couple weeks later, he's catching nine or ten balls, a couple touchdowns, and just making huge play after huge play. And he's probably as fast as me or you. And it does not matter because his contested catches are elite. He's still a pretty good route runner. And he's excellent in the short and intermediate game. And now Mahomes is going to have more and more trust with him. Just throw the ball his way. And most of the time, if he's looking at you, it, it's not a 50-50 ball. It's like an 80-20 ball, him. So we'll see if the Chiefs are inclined to do anything more tomorrow. Uh, you know, there were some rumors on the interweb about Lattimore, the corner from um from the Saints I'm like I listen you can never have enough D- DBs and defenders I mean if they were to do something like that I would imagine they'll still sniff around some offensive weapons but maybe they feel like you get Pacheco back you let Hopkins worthy keeps growing uh that if our defense is good enough we'll just we'll just smother you as we did last season and was a big reason that we were the Super Bowl champs so Chiefs go to 8 no and the Bucks you know, lose their fourth game in, in, in their last five and now face the 49ers who are coming off a bye. So th- this this season could kind of get away from them fast, e- even though it's it's not an embarrassment what happened to them. Right, we'll get into an embarrassment that happened to a team in their division, but fun game. That, that game got more entertaining as, as it went on. Uh, let's do a quick penthouse and outhouse uh, because it, the outhouse is the most fun part. I mean, the penthouse... Chiefs are on scholarship. <laughs> they ain't moving. They were not going to leave tonight, even if they had lost that game. They're just, this team doesn't even feel as good as the last couple of years. And it's not inconceivable that they go, what, 15 and two? Is 16 and one on the table? I, I, I'd i be stunned if they went undefeated, but someone's got to beat them. <laughs> they, they, they just find ways. Uh, I, I would, if I was a betting man right now, I'd say 15 and two, which is a problem because the bills are going to lose another game and they already have two losses and the Ravens, because they blew that game against the Ravens and lost to Jameis Winston already got three losses. So you, you got, you got a pretty comfortable lead because these other teams fucked up early in the season that like, listen, you watch the Ravens when their offense is on, it's incredible. You watch how well Josh Allen has played this year. And honestly, their defense And I feel like this is a pretty good muscle flex year for Sean McDermott. He takes a lot of shit. He's made some mistakes and some big moments. No one can dispute that. But we try to promote and hold up high so many coaches in the NFL. Sean McDermott runs circles around, what, 85% of them? I mean, it's just going to be another 13-win season for the guy. And second or third seed and have a pretty good chance. He's going to be favored in playoff games. And it's just like, can he beat the Chiefs? I mean, that's... It's like, well, yeah, certain people just couldn't beat Michael Jordan. I Trust me, I lost a lot of people lose to Tiger Woods. Pretty sure not many people beat Tom Brady. And if you did, you immediately became a legend. So they're beating everybody else. 
And it's really just going to come down for the Ravens and the Bills. Like, can you take him out in this team, in that organization, which it feels like they are more susceptible this year, but I, I fell for it last year and I got burned financially, as, as a lot of people did. And this year, even if I'm like, I don't trust him enough, I'm definitely not betting against him. Might just be a stay away. But I think those three teams, and we'll see with the Steelers coming off the bye, uh, play, play the Commanders this week. Th- their record's going to be really good. And can they win the division? Can, is this rust thing a little smoke and mirrors, or is it sustainable? But you, you got T.J. Watt. I mean, a big reason last year that they blimped into the playoffs because the guy got hurt and he missed a lot of games. If he plays 17 games and he's healthy, he basically is their quarterback. He's by far their best player, and he's one of the most impactful players in the league. And you have a guy like that, if Russ can just play solid in these playoff games, if he can just wreck shop and, and ruin whoever he's playing, like they, they would have a chance. Not because of Russ, but because of T.J. Watt, which is the type of guy you want. I mean, Chris Jones had basically won the Chiefs the Super Bowl last year in the biggest moment. He was the guy that shoved Purdy on the ground when Ayuk was wide open. And to me, in the NFC, there's only one team that deserves it right now. It's the Lions. I mean, there are other teams that have a shot, but like Minnesota's struggling to beat Joe Flacco. The Packers just got punked. The Rams are coming. They're four and four. The Niners are four and four. I mean, the Cardinals, actually, when you look at their losses, someone sent me this stat, like the teams they've lost to are a combined like 27 and eight. I mean, they they have lost to excellent teams this season, but I, I just, I can't put them in that category. Atlanta, like, I'm sorry, you're just, I'm I'm not taking you that seriously. Uh, you're going to be a playoff team. I, I probably plan on betting against you in the first round. We'll have to wait for the matchup, but I, I, I think I can already see it from coming from a mile away. Like, that's a good underdog spot for the Green Bay Packers, the Minnesota Vikings. If that's the Rams or the 49ers, like, hammer time. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is the AFC's best teams feel like better than the than the NFC's best teams, which basically just feels like the Lions. And then there's a huge group of other teams, and we'll see how it plays out over the next three or four weeks. But I, I think it's fair to say that the Lions have really kind of established themselves, you know, alone with those other AFC teams. The outhouse, listen, a lot of you guys like the Porta Potty Panthers. Uh and, and they deserved it. I mean, they they had they had looked like an expansion team. But when you are the Porta Potty Panthers, and your quarterback, who most people view as just a, a, a major bust and not a very good player, leads essentially a game-winning drive against the Saints, and then less than, what, 12, 15 hours after, they fire Dennis Allen in the nicest way possible. They're like, we love the guy, we love the family, he'll always be a Saint, but pack up your shit and get out of here. You're an embarrassment, and rightfully so. And now they, you know, the, the the thing going viral about the quarterbacks with the most losses, it's basically just David Carr and Derek Carr. Uh, you know, after year five, after year six, after year seven, no one has more losses after year eleven than than Derek Carr. He has literally got Dennis Allen. He's been the starting quarterback for Dennis Allen being fired twice, first time in NFL history. Obviously, a bunch of injuries, but you lose to the Porta Potta Panther Porta Potty Panthers you have to fall under that category too. And to me, that vaults you in a category. Like I watched a little bit on one of the four boxes of the Titans and Drake may like, I I just, they, they don't have a lot going for them, but I, I take them more seriously than a team that just loses at Carolina as a massive favorite. Like I, I can't even put them in the outhouse. You could argue once you lose to the Porta potty Panthers, you go into your own own category. Like you're basically like the shit at the bottom of the porta potty. That is the Saints. They've lost seven straight games. Listen, we can make fun of the Giants all we want. They're, they're terrible. And they are going nowhere fast. But and listen, th- their scores might not totally reflect the game you watch, but you're like, hey, they're just they're fighting along. They're just not very good. No one thought that they were going to beat the commanders. I would say everyone, especially when Derek plays, you're like, listen, the Panthers are losing this game. And then you look up 
and Derek's looking over at Alvin Kamara, and the Panthers have the ball back, and they're just kneeling it. You're like, wait, are the Panthers about to win this game? And have the same amount of wins as the Giants, as the Saints, as the Titans, as the Patriots. You're like, no, no. You're like, yeah. So I, I, for this week's outhouse, I, I got to put one NFC. I, I'm putting the Saints over the Panthers as being that shitty. And then the other team who fires three coaches, who fires in right after Halloween, three coaches on the offensive side of the ball with a first-year head coach. It is crazy. And here's the irony here, how connected they are. Dennis Allen, Derek Carr, former Raiders, now on the Saints. Everyone's getting fired. Who's interconnected here? It's like, how can you, as someone sent me a text today, a former NFL player is like, who cleans house like this in the middle of the season? What what is this going to do? It's not like you have some top 12 quarterback who's underachieving. Your quarterbacks are Aiden O'Connell, who 99% of sports fans couldn't point out of a lineup, and Gardner Minshew, who is the ultimate backup quarterback. And if you put him on a good team and he has a right coach, he can be kind of competitive like every other game. If you put him on an awful team with bad coaching, you are fucked. I mean, you should bet against that team every single week. I mean, the Bengals are in shambles. In absolute shambles. And you looked up and Joe Burrow's like, whoop, whoop, touchdown, 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 touchdown. It's like the Raiders. It, it is crazy. Listen, years change, presidents change, uh, weather changes. One thing never one thing never changes, always stays the same, is the Raiders suck. It is insane how crappy this franchise is. The NFL season is rolling along and contenders are separating from the pack. The one thing that hasn't changed this season, DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is the number one place to bet touchdowns. I love doing it. Touchdown passes, touchdown runs, long runs, the tush push, well not today, you name it, they will do it. Bet on touchdowns, ready to place your first bet, try betting on something as simple like a player scoring a touchdown. Go to DraftKings Sportsbook app and make your pick. Here's a reason for new customers to do a touchdown dance of their own. I do it every day in the office watching football. Bet five bucks to get 150 in bonus bets if your bet wins. Score big with DraftKings Sportsbook, the number one place to bet touchdowns. Download the DraftKings app today and use the code JOHN. That's code J-O-H-N for new customers to get 150 in bonus bets. If your bet wins, you win. Bet just five bucks. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. Okay, this was a game that has been circled on the calendar the last several years because it's usually had huge playoff implications. It's had huge implications for the division um, and for home field. But now the Cowboys stink, and the Eagles are basically battling the Commanders. And they are currently a massive favorite on the road in Dallas. Obviously, Dak Prescott injured his hamstring. Out. You have CeeDee Lamb, hurt his shoulder week to week. Who knows if he's going to play? Before we get into the Cowboys, watching the Eagles, and this is why I picked them to start the year, I I don't think we can – I think people underestimated how much talent is on that team. I also think people underestimated how good Saquon Barkley is. If he's healthy, he is such a difference-making player. He is just the total package as a runner can run inside, can break tackles, can go off tackle, can go outside run, sweeps, pitches. You get him in space. He's got elite speed. Obviously, the play that went viral, doing the 360, the backwards hurdle, like he's an all-time athlete. And he's got elite speed and power. Like this guy is a game-changing player to go with Devontae Smith, who's a no-doubt-about-it contract extension guy. The Eagles already did that. And A.J. Brown. When healthy, which, you know, he's battled some injuries, is easily one of the best wide receivers in the league. They have a good offensive line. They have, you know, a quarterback who's playing at a at a high level. And when he's proven, when he runs, like he's a very, very effective player. And they got Vic Fangio on defense with a ton of talented players. Linebacker can be a little bit of a question mark, but a lot of young defensive linemen. They, this team is oozing with talent. Now their coach is like a drunk dude at a blackjack table 
hitting on 17 and 18. It is a wild ride. <laughs> it really is. You know, going for it on fourth and shorts, going for it on two pointers instead of just kicking the field goals. He's very entertaining. He, he really is. And that game, you know, against the Jags, a little freakish. It was close. They're up 22 nothing. The Jags score. Like the next play or two, Saquon does, you know, a fumble where he just falls on the ground by himself. Ball hits the ground. You're not technically down because no one hits you. Jags pick it up and return it for a touchdown. So, and then, listen, the Jags got two two-pointers. So, uh, it was 22-16. to 16. You're like, whoa. I started thinking, if Sirianni blows this to Doug Peterson, uh, Joel Embiid is completely off the hook. But he didn't. He handled it. N'Kobe Dean made a great pick on an awful play by one of the most overrated players in, like, the history of America and Trevor Lawrence. But, listen, the Eagles, like, this team is going to win 12 or 13 games on talent alone. Now, do we trust them when they get to the playoffs with Sirianni just kind of reckless nature? You never quite know what's going to happen. It's going to be a wild ride. Must watch television. Big win for the Eagles. But they go into Dallas and all signs point to them, kicking the shit out of them. I actually think if you're a Cowboy fan, this is a good thing. Because listen, it was clear early on, yeah, yeah, probably not a playoff team. Now it's kind of clear you're headed for a disastrous season. Let's use the Chargers last year as an example. Their season fell off the rails. It ended up twofold. I mean, two things happened, right? Landed Jim Harbaugh and landed top picks in every round. Well, they found their starting right tackle, who's a stud in Joe Alt, because they drafted fifth. Then they also drafted high in the second round, and they got Ladd McConkey, who's going to be a high-end player in the NFL for a long time. And they got other guys in the draft that obviously they really like. When you have an awful season and you're not going to make the playoffs, you are much better off going 6-11 and and drafting 8th than going 8-9 and and drafting 15th. Because it's not just about the first round. It's literally about every round. So in the second round, you are drafting 39th or 41st. How often do we see guys at the top of the second round become impact all pro players. So clearly the Cowboys are going to have a new coach. Mike McCarthy's not going to be extended. They're going to blow it all up. Rightfully so. But this job to me becomes way more desirable. Obviously, Jerry's a wild card, not an easy environment to work in. And they have a ton of high price players, right? Dak's making 200. CD's making over 100. Harson has to get paid this offseason. They have three guys they're invested in that make as much money as any other team's three guys. It's a boatload of cash they have invested in this guys. You got to hit on draft picks. Well, I think they've drafted pretty well over the last couple of years. But now gives you an opportunity to draft premium players. Because it is hard to draft at 25, right? Because it's not just 25 on Thursday night in round one. It's 25th in the second round. It's 25th in the third round. You're just picking at the end of the rounds for all seven rounds. Now, obviously, you can manipulate it and trade up. But, like, look at the Chargers. The Chargers have a long way to go, and we'll get into them in a minute. But, like, the easiest way to just get the train back on the tracks is to utilize, once you get a new coach and new administration that you feel comfortable knows what they're doing. Now, part of Jerry's job this offseason is going to be to land his Jim Harbaugh. Is that Bill Belichick? Is that Mike Vrabel? I I don't know. But if they get the coach right, you can really take advantage of a draft after a bad season. Because the Cowboys for three straight years have been drafting 12th. Or excuse me, I mean, have been winning 12 games. They haven't been sniffing drafting in the top 10 of the rounds. And now, like, this season clearly is going to suck. The rest of the year is going to be rough. It is could get uglier. As Dak said, we bleeping suck. And he's not wrong. They do. They're a tough watch. So the silver lining is the draft. And you want to be as crappy the rest of the season as possible. I don't think, you know, winning one or two more games the rest of the season, that is not the worst thing. Speaking of chaotic franchises, it was last year at this time that the Raiders and rightfully so, fired Josh McDaniels. 
who, like his previous stop in Denver, had become the first head coach in NFL history to not make it past year two in either spot of his head coaching tenures. Obviously, they fired the general manager as well. Well, then they go all in on Antonio Pierce, and he gets the pick of the litter. Like, you get to hire any staff you want. And he hires some guys, Lou Getze, which everyone's like, are we sure Lou Getze is any good? He hires Rich Scangarillo, who is kind of a laughing stock within NFL circles. And he also hires the assistant offensive line coach from the 49ers. Well, last night, some people text me. I'm trying to fall asleep at like 11, 12 o'clock. And it's sometimes hard after football nights. You, you, you got to kind of come down. I'm just laying there wide awake. But I don't want to look at my phone because I remember these Chip Kelly talked about it. He brought in these Navy SEAL guys that, like, when you put the phone close to your eyes late at night, it triggers something in your brain. You're just making it worse trying to fall asleep. So I, I try to be careful with that phone in my eyes when I'm laying in bed, like, past, like, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So people are texting me about the Raiders firing somebody, and I'm not really paying attention. And when I get up this morning, I realized they didn't just fire their offensive coordinator. They fired three people. It, it really is kind of sad how bad Mark Davis has been. Because unlike Dan Snyder, which by all accounts was like legitimately a bad person, people hated working there and it was just an embarrassment. I do think Mark's heart is in the right place. He is really trying to do the right thing. Right? He goes from Gruden, who gets fired midseason that was out of his control. Then he gets an offseason. He goes, listen, we have this special teams coach that everyone likes in the interim, but... I got the opportunity to hire Josh McDaniels and his general manager from Belichick. I, I think this is worth the risk. Blows up in his face. Then he kind of goes back to, I should have hired the interim coach. You got players on your team telling you to hire Antonio Pierce. He does. Then Cliff Kingsbury won't take the job because your organization's a little cheap. You'll only offer him two-year contract. Washington's like, we'll give you three, partly because you don't fully trust Antonio Pierce. And you don't want to be obligated for more years if you got to end up firing everybody, which in a weird way was the right call by the Raiders and also the right call by Cliff. Go their separate ways. Clearly, it's going to change Cliff's life. Being in Washington, coaching Jaden Daniels, the Raiders just blow everyone out who I don't think would have been hired as coordinators anywhere. And now you just have this chaotic hamster wheel that never ends. And the Raiders are able to be much more ruthless in this modern day situation of their franchise, because the media deals worth more. They have more money. Vegas is worth dramatically more than the disastrous Oakland situation. He just has money to pay guys a couple million dollars, a couple million dollars, pay guys to go away. Because even if they only gave this offensive coordinator a two year deal, like he's probably making one and a half million dollars a year. So Mark Davis is probably paying him over two million just to not work. Talk about the American dream. I, I One time I've been paid to go away. And it was, I, I don't remember, maybe it was 10 grand, maybe it was 20 grand. It felt like at the time a lot of money. I can't imagine being paid over seven figures to not work. It's like, wait, I'm really rich and I don't have, you you're telling me not to come into the job? You would be surprised how often I talk to people around the NFL that say, person X, who's a general manager, who's a coach, who's an uh, who's a assistant coach, his fingers are crossed that they fire him. He would die to be paid to leave this situation. He is miserable. They're humans too. And you get put in these positions where you're stuck. Listen, I, I'm not crying for these guys. They are making a boatload of money. We're talking about one percenters. Life is good. It's like, what about their children? Well, yeah, okay, maybe they'll have to move. They're still going to private school. And they, they can still get, you know, an $80,000 car for them on their 16th birthday. So, like, th their problems are first-class problems. Plus, they chose this profession. Part of coaching is moving. I, I don't feel sorry for you there. Pick another job if you don't want to move around. It's part of the gig. That's why it pays a premium. But I just feel like the Raiders are just so poorly run. And this is never going to end. And this is not a Dan Snyder situation where it's just like, he's just a bad guy. Mark, everyone likes Mark. He is literally trying to win. But it's just not going to work with him as the owner. Like, we have enough evidence now. It's the same shit every year. 
it literally never ends. They fire coaches in the middle of the season more than any franchise. It really is nuts. It's always a coordinator here, an offensive coordinator here, a defensive coordinator there, a head coach there, a head coach there. It never ends. Everyone made fun of Al Davis at the end of his life, right? He was going through a coach here, a coach there, firing people on stop. This is the same situation, just at a higher level because they have more money. And they have some good players on the team. Get rid of Devontae. Now you got Max Crosby. The owner says we won't trade Max Crosby. You're going nowhere, and you're going nowhere fast. Your team is a joke. And to me, like, this is... I just think we have enough evidence. As long as the Davis family owns this team, this is never going to change. It really is not. Because I, I think we can already see the light at the end of the tunnel in this situation. Is Antonio Pierce a one and done? It's clearly on the table. How could you argue otherwise? Like, he is, he's safe. In in what world would a guy that fires three coaches November 1st, essentially, his first year as the full-time head coach, safe. In any other situation, a coach that blows guys like this out in the middle of the season, you'd be like, well, his job is next. And there's a thing, like, would anyone be shocked if the day after the season, Antonio Pierce is fired? Tom Telesco is fired? It, it never ends. And I, I feel for Raider fans because in a league where every team, it feels like, has moments, they just never do. They, they not only never win, they always suck. They don't even, they're at the point now where the majority of their games, you don't need to watch. They are completely irrelevant. And I hear all these people say this all the time, these older people around the NFL. The league is better when the Raiders are good. And the answer is that's just not true. Because for the last 20 plus years, the league has never, ever been more popular and made more money. And the Raiders, for the last 50 years, have never been more popular irrelevant to the landscape of winning and losing because they always lose. And now they're in a division with Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes, who is, I, I don't know, easily, if Belichick and Brady, because they got six, are 1A, they got to be 1B in my lifetime. You got Jim Harbaugh, who we're about to dive into, is just a winning machine. And Sean Payton and Bo Nix, like you can just see the trajectory of the franchise. They are dramatically better than they were last year. And next year, I would imagine they'll be dramatically better than they were this year as they get more and more money once they get rid of that Russell Wilson cap space. I I, I just feel sorry for this fan base because what are you supposed to do? I mean, you're just stuck and you just know the outcome and you try to sell yourself in the offseason. Maybe this is the year. Maybe we can compete. And then it's not even Halloween. You're like, yeah, we just suck again. How does this happen? I, I don't I don't know. Speaking of the Chargers, and listen, part of football is most of these owners, the difference of them all is you just hire the right guy or you don't. And there is an element of luck and randomness in all this. Right? The Chargers have been the better version of the Raiders for the last 20 years. But they are synonymous with that franchise because they also have just found ways to lose on a higher level. And they have made the playoffs more consistently and they have had better teams. But like the Raiders, it was always easy to make fun of them because they always went cheap on the coach. You're like, how is this team not better than it is? It's like, well, they have the second lowest paid coach in the league. It's what I've always given credit to Mark Davis. He has really tried when he did not have the money to, I mean, now he does, but at the time when he hired Gruden, it was a really aggressive move. They hadn't moved yet. He didn't have the influx of cash. He's like, I give the guy $100 million. Then a couple of years later, I'll give Josh McDaniels $80 million. That blew up in his face, but I, I give you credit for being aggressive because you know if you get that guy right, it changes the landscape of where you're headed. Dean Spanos has always been the opposite. It's like, I'm, we could give me Mike McCoy for $2 million. Give me Brandon Staley for $4 million. Give me Anthony Lynn for $3.5 million. It's like, Dean, this, this isn't that complicated. Why your team 
is underachieving because you need a coach that is worth three or four X what you're paying this guy. And this off season, the heavens aligned. Jim Harbaugh wanted out because the NCAA was coming after his ass, but I got an asking price. I, I cost $16 million a year and the coaches I'm bringing with me, uh, Zach Minter, my defensive coordinator, he ain't cheap either. He probably makes close to what Anthony Lynn and Mike McCoy were making. Maybe Brandon Staley makes, made a little more than him, but I, my guess is he makes two and a half, three million dollars. And Jim's well over 15. And guess what happens? In Jim Harbaugh's last three stops, the San Francisco 49ers in 2010 were six and 10. His first year in 2011, they were 13 and three. This is why I told everybody, I don't give a shit what their roster looks like. I don't care how limited their wide receivers are. I don't care how bad you think their depth is. This fucking guy does one thing and one thing only. He wins everywhere he goes. And the first thing he does is turn that thing around immediately. I'm not saying he's going to win the Super Bowl year one. I wasn't saying he was going to win the national championship year one, but he ain't going to lose. His first year at Michigan. Remember, in 2014, his last year with the 49ers, the Michigan Wolverines went 5-7. and seven. Harbaugh's first year, they went 10-3. and three. Last year, the Chargers, I think we even forget this because it's 10 months removed. They went 5-12. and 5-12. and 12. They drafted last year ahead of the New York Giants. Think about that. How shitty we view the New York Giants. How bad they have been. The Chargers... Drafted ahead of the New York Giants. The Chargers drafted ahead of the Tennessee Titans. Think think how many bad teams the Chargers drafted ahead of last year. They were that bad. 5-12. and 12. Jim Harbaugh, November 4th, currently has five wins. His records for the last three spots were 16-29. and 29. He's not even halfway through this season. He's 28-9. And I would imagine five. I mean, he's at minimum winning five more games. I bet he gets to 11, so you're talking six. He's going to have 34 wins. That is almost in three spots, year one, almost a 20-win difference, assuming he gets to 11 wins. Who knows? He may go to 12. Look at his schedule. It's crazy how good this guy is. It really is. And yeah, he's a weirdo. And yeah, he talks sometimes all over the map, and he's just a different cat. He's a borderline nut job, but he is a football savant. And whatever the hell he does, and I've heard this forever, well, he doesn't call the plays. He's kind of a meathead. You can give me any fucking excuse you want about the guy. All I know is his resume speaks for itself. In this industry, more than any other, you can quantify a guy, is he good or bad, based on one thing. What's his win-loss record? And everywhere this guy goes, that loss to win ratio is always like you're losing way more than you're winning. And then you get Jim and that pendulum immediately flips. And all of a sudden, within a couple of years, you're competing for Super Bowls. You're competing for national championships. And once he got that monkey off his back, which was a really big deal, because I listen, if you wanted to be critical, he could never win the big one. Like history was on your side up until 2023. And the moment he beat Nick Saban in the Rose Bowl, it was on like Donkey Kong. Clearly, he matched up really get well against Washington and DeBoer, kicked his ass, national champs. If they do a good enough job building this thing, they're not good enough this year. They might not even be good enough next year. But within a couple years, he currently has uh, Justin Herbert, who last year, everyone's like, what the hell's going on with Justin Herbert? Stop comparing him to Mahomes, Lamar, and Josh Allen. He's over 65% with receivers that are meh at best has 10 touchdowns and one interception. And I don't think the numbers do him justice. When you watch him play, you go, yeah, there's a big four. There's Mahomes, Lamar, Allen. There's basically one, one B and one C. And then there's two because this guy's that good. And I told Colin, you could throw Matt Stafford in there as well. That would probably be the top five as we sit here today just in terms of physical gifts and everything. Obviously, Jared Goff's having an incredible season. But we all acknowledge, like, Jared Goff doesn't have these guys' physical gifts. 
Herbert at any moment can run 30 yards, right? And obviously can throw it a mile long. So can the other guys. Lamar probably has the worst arm out of the group, but he's by far the best athlete and he's become so accurate. And his, I'm not saying his arm's bad, but relative to like Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, Matt Stafford, it's not quite that, even though it's really good. Obviously, Jared Goff, like I just, I don't put him in that category, even though he's having an elite season. And I, I just think, Jim Harbaugh, congrats, man, because you are a certified ass kicker. Okay, a couple NFL notes. Christian McCaffrey, and listen, I'm recording this basically 24 hours before the trade deadline. So we'll see what happens. But if this guy is healthy, by far, unless Miles Garrett or Max Crosby is traded, the biggest trade acquisition will be Christian McCaffrey. A guy that has not played this season, if he comes back and he looks 85, 90% of what he was, that is a massive addition. And that puts the 49ers not just back into the playoff conversation, but like into the NFC landscape. Remember, they beat the Packers and the Lions last year. Like, this was a team that has owned the Rams. This is a team that last year played the Eagles and beat the living piss out of them. So they are going to be very comfortable playing all these teams. Now, you could argue the Lions are better this year. And the other thing the Lions are going to have is home field advantage, more than likely. And what I know, whether, like, the Eagles only have one game difference, the same with Washington, so we'll see how the season plays out. But the Niners are not going to have home field advantage like they did last year. So they will have to go on the road. Well, I've seen them go to Dallas. I've seen them go to Green Bay and win playoff games. They have done it before. They're comfortable in that environment. And I I just think they're a team that if Christian McCaffrey comes back and he looks the part, watch out. Because that is as big of an addition you can make during the trade deadline. Unless, like I said, Max Crosby or Miles Garrett, which all signs point to, they will not be dealt. Though if I were those teams, I would highly entertain trading them both. You know, someone texted me today, a buddy in the league was like, remember when Adam Peters took a bunch of crap during the, like his quarterback search when he basically went up to the last couple days and he went to Top Golf and he did a lot of work right up until the end on what quarterback he was going to draft, right? Because he knew Caleb Williams, who the Bears basically acknowledged they were going to draft six months before they even you know, the draft came about. Like, they they knew they were drafting him in the fall. And Adam Peters took a lot of shit. Their story is not written. And I said this to Colin, and I said this on my podcast. By no means are you putting anything in concrete or in Sharpie. But as we sit here right now, the gap between these two players is a mile wide. And the one thing Caleb's going to have to overcome that now Jaden, it looks like the Washington Commanders is going to be well run, is not, is a franchise that just doesn't really know what they're doing. For this very historic, this huge brand and this massive city that has this huge fan base, the Bears historically are kind of a joke the last, I don't know, 15 years. I mean, their owner feels like she's 150 years old. They're very cheap. And it reflects what we're watching this season. Eberflus completely over his head. And the last two weeks are a complete embarrassment. And then you got Jaden, who just has dominated kind of from day one, who has a real coach and now a real competitive owner and a GM that has won rings with multiple teams who was the most qualified general manager candidate probably the last 20 years. So it is funny how things age. Adam Peters taking these guys to top golf. Does he know what he's doing? Meanwhile, the Bears, it's like they zeroed in on Caleb Williams. Should maybe they have done a little more research on Jaden Daniels? Because you just watch the guys play physically. Part of the knock was Caleb's his all time physical freak. What the hell is the difference? Jaden, a lead arm. Jaden, better athlete. Jaden's taller, so it's easier for him to see. He definitely has more touch. Now, you could argue it's just confidence, right? And Caleb's lost his because he's playing for an organization that just ruins your confidence, which, okay. But how often are we going to make excuses? Is it going to be like year four or five, like we're doing with Trevor Lawrence? Well, if he just if he played here, if he had this guy coaching for him, if he was throwing it to this guy, it's like, guys, we've been watching him for long enough now. Can we just acknowledge not very good? He's not terrible. 
He's not like some Jamarcus Russell all-time scrub, but he's just not that good, especially relative to paying a guy $200 million. If you ask the Jags right now, you can get a redo. You you can do a, a little take back. Hey, uh, I know we uh, handed you $200 million. We'd like to take that back. What do you think they would say? Of course they would say yes, which it was moronic at the time, like guys. Even Tua, like at the time, at least Tua had produced for multiple years at a much higher level. Like Trevor Lawrence, like this guy didn't even throw 20 touchdowns last year. You sure about this one? It's like, yeah, we think we are. And then six months later, ah, not really. Well, of course not. Awful decision. So I, I just think sometimes it's funny how stories happen around the draft where we just give a guy a bunch of credit and then we're critical of another guy. And then six months later, we look back and we're like, yeah, that was a pretty terrible take. That wasn't one of my takes. I mean, if everyone freaking out about Top Golf, it's like, who would have thought six months later the Washington has the best quarterback by a pretty wide margin?